All right, we're going to get started with the React talk now. Just go ahead. Right. Yeah. My name is James Kent, and I'm here with. Uh, so I'm Matt Gilbride. Both James and I are working on React projects at different clients right now. Um, uh, so we figured since pair programming is all the rage right now, we are going to pair present. <laughs> um, so we've got an extra microphone up here, but if we botch the mic situation, just, just yell. <laughs> and we'll, we'll get it figured out. So we're going to get started. So we're going to start with um, the agenda, what we're going to go over today. Um, we're going to start with what is React. Um, and then we're going to take a look at uh, Create React App, which is kind of like a, um, uh, a boot starter for uh, any React project that's Greenfield. Um, in many cases, for existing projects, you can't use this, but it's a good place to get started if you're new to React. Then we're going to talk about what React isn't. And this is really a comparison uh, to some of the other frameworks you'll be seeing today. So Angular, what you saw earlier. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, React. It's, it's a library. It's not a framework. So what are the things you need to build a React app? Um, we'll go over some of the common companion libraries. Uh, and then last, we're going to kind of do um, what the Angular talk did and say, like, what makes React a good tool for your team? Or what teams does React fit? OK, so uh, what is React? Where's my? There we go. All right, so it is, um, for those of you from the old kind of model view controller days, React is kind of thought of as just the view, right? It is only a view library. Um, for building component-based UIs, created back in 2013, I believe. Um, it also includes a declarative DSL for describing components called JSX. This is the kind of, if you think of Angular as um, embedding some JavaScript in your HTML templates, it's the flip side, right? So it's HTML in your JavaScript. You're usually just writing JavaScript and then embedding HTML-like, you know, angle bracket things in there. Either way tends to feel awkward for certain people or others. Um, and up until the most recent release of React, you can actually kind of opt out of this. So you could use React's create element API directly and not have to deal with the JSX stuff. Um, and we'll go over that in a minute, um, although that is going away. So just forewarning to any of you that want to do that. All components are a function of two parameters. So it's a highly functional library. You have props that are read-only properties that get passed into any component. And then state, which is managed by the component itself. So it can update its own state and kind of change how it might be rendering based on that. Um, an important gotcha here and kind of unfortunate vocabulary mishap is that Redux uses this term heavily as well. And Redux state and the state of a React component are very much not the same thing. Um, so you know, beginners tend to get confused with that problem. Um, and then components also have a specific life cycle that can be used to influence behavior, a lot like life cycles that you've seen in other view libraries. Um, this is it, so this is the most recent one. This page kind of has a handy dandy React version changer here, and it has a checkbox to show less used methods. Um, they change pretty significantly between React 16.3 and 16.4, I believe. They deprecated some lifecycle methods, and in React 17, some of them are actually going to go away. Um, so you need to be careful with things other than component did mount, uh, did update and unmount. Uh, there's some things that were there before. Component will receive props that's, that's going to go away. Um, and that's the basics. Um, so Matt mentioned JSX. Uh, we're going to just show you, we're going to go to the Babel website, which uh, you can actually write code in ES6 or React code, and it'll show you um, what it's going to get transpiled to. So in a very basic example, uh, on this side, we're writing um, some very basic React components. Make it bigger. Yeah, zoom in. Awesome. Is that better? OK. So we have two components. One is this container component. It's, um, oh. When it's big, it doesn't look as good, though. There you go. <laughs> um, it uh, basically is just instantiating this hello something component, which we declare up here. And it's passing the prop world. I'm like Vanna. <laughs> um, and 
the hello something component is just going to say hello and then whatever the something prop is. So hopefully this will say hello world when it renders on your browser. Um, under the hood or um, pre uh, React 16, you could actually write your React components rather than using JSX, which is on the left here, you could write it this way um, with React create uh, element. And so what you're seeing here is create element takes um, the first uh, prop or the first um, argument. Yeah, argument is um, the element itself. So in this case, it's a div. The next thing is going to be any uh, props um, it, it has. And then the next thing you're going to see is, uh, I can actually go over here, and it's children. Um, but so for a while, you could actually write React this way and not uh, require Babel on your project to uh, do the uh, transpilation process. This was good a while ago when you were introducing uh, React onto some like enterprise project. But uh, now React has kind of moved away from that, being like, nope, that's all going to happen under the hood for you. Um, cool. So I'm going to jump back to our slides once I found my mouse. Um, and we're going to take a look at Create React App. So as I said earlier, Create React App is a way to get started with Re React quickly. Um, it's, very, it's pretty much only useful for like greenfield projects. So like when you're starting a new project and you don't have any um, existing stuff. But it's neat because it provides a lot of the configuration that you need to get started on a React app um, out of the box. So Webpack can be difficult for people to understand. It can be hard to set up. Um, with Create React app, it's all under the hood. You can, they don't even show you a, um, a uh, Webpack file at all unless um, you do something called eject the, uh, all the source code. But basically, all you need to go is to go to this GitHub site, and then you just need to clone the project. Um, I've already done that. Yeah. So all I've done is this uh, MPX. I feel, like, uh, I feel like two sizes bigger. Two sizes bigger. Good? Yep. Bigger? Bigger. 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 All I'm doing here is actually going to start a server. <laughs> um, so it provides a number of NPM methods for you. You can just get started. It's saying that I already have a, something running on this port, so I'm going to say run on a different port. And now we're going to bring up what the Create React app, like default app is. So super simple. It has a nice logo here. So when we look at the code, oops. <coughs> so yeah, very similar to what Angular CLI does to yeah. create an Angular project, the same concept. Um, but this is all it gives you. It's a very small application, basically no configuration files. Um, but where, where it all kind of um, gets started is this like, index.js file. So all that's happening here, this is the beginning of any React application, this line, uh, line number seven. And this is saying mount my app, this is the root level component of our app, onto um, this ID um, in our HTML. Um, so if we take a look at our HTML, uh, it has a root div, and basically our whole single page app is going to be mounted inside this div. So let's take a look at what we're mounting and how we got that cool black page with the spinning React symbol. So this is all it is here. Um, that's pretty cool. So that's what makes this happen. But we actually want to do something for real now. And all good developers start with the Hello World app. <laughs> uh, oh, that's good enough for our purposes. Um, and there you go. So it even comes with like the hot module reloading, which is a pain to set up by yourself. Um, so if you have a choice, use Create React app to get started. I'm jumping back to the slides. Okay, so um, what React isn't, it, I guess in this context we'll say it isn't Angular. Um, so it is not a full fledged framework. Everything other than rendering, you know, just rendering components is up to you. Um, and the biggies are state management, routing, forms, styling, and testing. 
Um, now, with that being said, React has been around long enough that are, there are kind of de facto stacks that work with common libraries, Redux being one of them, React Router being one of them, where these guys are working closely with the React teams. In fact, most of you know the original creator of Redux, Dan Abramoff, now works for Facebook on the React team. Um, so while it's a choose your own adventure, there's a lot of kind of beaten paths that are there for you to pick, you know, something that's going to work in production. Um, that's about it. Okay. So I'm just gonna explain to you our stack as we go because we will be showing you our running application. So I just wanted to tell you, these are the things that we chose as we kind of went and built our project. So first off, we're using TypeScript. Um, so if some of the JavaScript looks foreign to you, it's because we have a lot of additional type information there. And one, one important gotcha there is TypeScript used to be kind of hard to do with Create React App, but with the release that got put out this October, I think just a month ago, they now support TypeScript by default. So you just create a TypeScript file and the Create React App under the hood will figure out how to transpile it and you know, generate a JavaScript file in production for you. Um, but TypeScript and React work really well together, though even without TypeScript, React does a bit of trying to figure out the shapes of the objects you're passing as props. And they, um, so there's a library called prop types, which um, TypeScript kind of takes the place of um, in our app. Um, so for our state management, we're using Redux. We'll talk about Redux in depth. Um, we'll also dive into RxJS. We've seen a bit of that today already. Um, and then in particular for RxJS and Redux, use Redux absorbables. So um, we chose React Router. Um, for routing, I'm just gonna run over these, but forms, we're using controlled forms. We're not using a, um, a library per se for our form management because the, the forms on our site are minimal. Um, for styling, we're using CSS modules and uh, SAS. Uh, CSS modules is also something that was introduced recently to create React app, but before you would have needed to do a lot more of configuration yourself to get that up and running. Um, and then last but not least, uh, testing. Maybe one of the most important things is testing. Um, this is actually something that uh, React, Create React App does have an opinion about, and it's saying that you're gonna be using Jest uh, as your test runner and your assertion library, and the Adafin has its own mocking framework. Um, and then we threw Enzyme on top of that, which uh, helps you mount your components um, and assert against the elements uh, in your DOM, or in your virtual DOM environment. Okay, so state management, uh, brief history lesson here. Uh, when React first came out, they worked on a kind of companion library called Flux that if, every, if any of you have ever heard of Elm, it took a lot of ideas from the Elm architecture. Um, and right around the t time that React started getting really popular, um, Redux came out, and Redux was essentially this guy, Dan Abramoff, who took those Flux uh, Elm concepts and tried to create a better, kind of easier wrapper around them, so kind of a simpler API around that Flux architecture. Um, if you've done any event sourcing development in the server side before, this is actually all very similar to event sourcing. It's all the same concepts, so, you know, we're seeing this pattern of things moving into the client, and as code moves into the client, we're seeing old server-side patterns also move into the client. So when I first saw the Redux dev tools, which we'll go over later, I was super excited. Having written some event sourcing stuff in the server, I was like, oh look, this is the same thing. It's all the same concepts. Um, and then there's another kind of big player in the game these days called MobX that doesn't really follow that architecture. I'm gonna let James talk about that. Um, so MobX doesn't really follow the flux pattern, as Matt just said. Uh, it more focuses on class interactions, and you're dealing with classes. Um, uh, well, JavaScript classes, we've kind of talked about yeah, that a lot today. Uh, but it focuses on like calling methods on classes, which then um, update you know, the class properties, and then there's computed values, um, which then uh, trigger reactions uh, for your um, for your uh, components, your JSX components. So it's a bit of a different way of doing things, but they are all solving the same problem and it's managing uh, state, uh, which can be quite massive on you know, um, big projects, so. And then the, the disclaimer there is that it is, oh. 
totally possible to use React without any state management library at all. In fact, a lot of people choose to learn things like Redux by not having them at first and going through the pain which is highlighted with right here. Um, and importantly, this says you know with and without Redux here, but it's really with and without any state management library, you end up in this kind of scenario. Um, yeah, so if we're taking a look at the left-hand side that says without Redux, uh, the pain is illustrated through how you need to communicate between your components. So a, um, a component really only can communicate uh, with its parent or it, it, with, its, uh, with its children via passing props to them. So uh, to communicate from like uh, one leaf of your tree to another, you need to basically bubble up whatever you want to communicate and then pass it back down through props. So this is where Redux comes in or any state management library. Basically, you connect your component uh, to your root store, your Redux store in this case, um, and then that will uh, pass pr uh, props um, of the new state to uh, any component that subscribes to them. So this really makes um, the, the data flow of your application much more easy to understand. Okay, so um, Redux, having, having come from kind of a, an event sourced backend that we were writing when I got into this, I found that I liked Redux a lot um, and I very much respect its creator, except I'm not a huge fan of the words that it uses to describe the things that it does. Um, so a, a lot of the confusion for me at first um, came down to vocabulary, so I'm just going to go over it quick. So the store is that, right? It's just a single global data repository as well as an API to manipulate the data inside that repository. The state is just the data and it is not a, the same thing as the state inside of your component, right? In fact, um, when we get into it, we'll see that people tend to call this the Redux state as a variable name in, in their code because they don't want to confuse one thing with the other. An action is an event if you come from the event sourcing world. So it's just something that happened. And usually it causes some update to that state, but not always. It doesn't have to. The reducer, this is perhaps the, the, the biggest uh, offender of the vocabulary problem in my humble opinion, um, is just a function that responds to actions and updates the state in some way or chooses not to update the state. Uh, if I came from like the map reduce world immediately before this, so the term reducer had connotations of like things happening in a distributed computing environment and it was just, I was like, oh, it's just the state updater. That's all it is. Um, that's, that's a horrendous name, but you know, we kind of have to live with it. And then dispatch is just a function that passes actions to reducers. So you commonly say when you're dealing with Redux, I dispatched this action. So React Redux. Um, so React Redux is a companion library with uh, React. Um, similarly, if you're using MobX, there's like Mob, uh, React MobX. And so you'll see a number of these kind of like React prefix libraries. So basically, they just help you um, connect your component to whatever state management solution that you're using. We're actually going to look at this more in depth in some code. So we don't need to spend too much longer on it here. All right. So here we're going to start with um, yeah, just. Let me do the reducer first, actually. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> My bad. Yes, I can. Oh, is that Bigger than that. Yeah. Bigger than that. Yeah. Okay. So, again, if you're if you're not familiar with TypeScript, there's some some TypeScript overhead here that might look unfamiliar. But any reducer kind of starts with this, uh, these things called actions, right? So we define what are the things that are going to happen that relate to my state. So in this case, we've got, we're going to make a schedule request to some server and we're going to get a success back. We're going to try to register, we're going to get a success back. Or we're going to get some sort of error related with an, a an AJAX request. And then I like to throw an extra action in there that says init, basically initialize my state back to what it was at the beginning. Um, 
There's another thing called action creators that you'll get into if you use Redux, but the important thing is here. So the spa state is a property called in flight or you know, awaiting a response from a server. Some error that came back from the server and a property called schedule, which is just an array of sessions, which is what you see you know, on that front home, home page. And then we have this thing called the spa reducer. And all reducers basically boil down to some switch over an action type. So the action types are schedule request, registration request, schedule success, and we just say, okay, if I get some sort of request, I wanna update my in-flight portion of the state to be true because I wanna render a spinner or whatever I wanna do while I'm waiting for the AJAX request to come back. If I get a success, I just wanna save the schedule, put it into my state. Registration success is a little weird in our case, but it basically just says, okay, I'm not in flight anymore. I got a response back. I successfully registered. And then we've got an error and an initialize. It basically just says, save off the error if something bad happens or give me a way to initialize the state back to the beginning, say, if I'm unmounting this component from the DOM. Do you want to do this first? Yeah, why don't we? So, James is gonna get into some of the JSX stuff in the component, but just to, we're gonna skip ahead a little bit and look at what the React Redux library gives you, which is just a way to now take those things that are in my Redux store and put them into my components, right? So React Redux gave, gives you at the bottom here a simple function called connect, which takes two arguments, map state to props and map dispatch to props, and then returns a function that you can call on a component. This is this is exactly what a higher, higher order component is if you've ever read about that in the React world. Um, so basically what it does is it takes my schedule component and it says, call this map state to props function and anytime the spa in flight state changes or the schedule changes, inject that value into my component, right? And then map dispatch to props just gives me basically access to my methods that I'm gonna use to change the state, right? So Map dispatch for props is gonna give me a function called schedule request that's gonna give me the ability to dispatch an action, request a schedule to Redux. There's shorter ways, like shorthand to do yep. things like this, but we're just trying to make it as explicit as possible. Um, so now that we've connected our component, um, we're gonna declare what props we're expecting to have when all is said and done. So a nice way to do this, especially in TypeScript, is to um, union your props based on where they're coming from. So uh, here I'm saying that these props are coming from my state, so I'm calling them state props. These props are, uh, are coming from actions or the dispatch, so they're my dispatch props. And then optionally, if someone was the caller, my parent was passing me props, you might have something uh, I think a lot of people call it own props. And then you union those things together. I don't have any own props, so we don't have any here. Uh, but you union those things together and you say, these are my final props. These are what I'm expecting when I'm running. So now we're just gonna go over um, our, our React component itself. So we talked about lifecycle methods earlier. We're using one of those here. So uh, the first time this component mounts, um, we're actually gonna request the schedule. So this is actually behind the scenes, um, doing a call to our server uh, and setting something um, on, our, uh, on our central state um, called schedule. So that's why it's optional at first, right? Um, and then later on, this will actually get back to us and be something that's real. So, um, You'll, you'll see some fancy like fragments and things in here. Uh, that's like a React uh, 16 um, edition. Basically, it's a way of like not muddying up your DOM with extra divs and things. Because each um, React component in its render method needs to return one um, JSX element. So you can't just like, I can't just remove this fragment and have everything work well. Um, but Getting down and dirty, what's happening is basically we're saying, hey, if this is in flight, or if we don't have our schedule yet, we're gonna show a spinning, a spinner component. Um, otherwise, we're gonna map over our schedule, which we know is an array of sessions, and we're gonna create these session links. 
And this is that bit where we're saying in React, unlike, you know what I'm talking about. So this is that bit where we're saying in React, unlike kind of Angular where you have a template and there's JavaScript-y like directives inside your template. And React is the opposite, right? I have HTML kind of embedded in JavaScript here. So when you say this.props.schedule.map, that is just JavaScript mapping over an array. And you're saying for each entry in that array, I'm going to return this HTML-y like thing, which is a React component. So now that we showed you a React component and how things are connected um, to our central store, we're actually going to dive into uh, the app running in a browser. And more importantly, we're going to look at um, what tools React and Redux have out there to help developers you know, develop a production-ready app. So here's our app. Um, but I'm going to open the dev tools. Um, we're going to start with the React dev tools. So do a, do a plus plus on both sides here so we can see it. Is that super small? Nice. Good. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. If Reese back, that's a challenge. <laughs> there you go. Well, you're going to run out of room for me to work with here. <laughs> All right. I don't know if you guys can see that right now. Sorry, I'm trying to find our um, the component that we were just looking at, the schedule. I need to make it smaller. So here's our schedule component. Um, you can see that it's actually, uh, it's wrapped with the connector. So that's what we mean by higher order component. A higher, a higher order component is a, um, is a function that takes a component and then maybe gives it some additional properties. So in this case, we're getting properties or props from the state. Um, but what's really cool about this plugin is that when I click on one of my components, I can actually see what props I'm given, and then you can actually change it um, in runtime. So actually, I want to say that in flight is now true. So we're showing our spinner. Um, so this is a way for you to see if things are working properly in your app, manipulating them in runtime, making sure everything is doing as expected. I won't spend too much time on that um, because the actual cooler plugin is the Redux plugin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so the Redux plugin here, I'm gonna go, I oh. might go a little smaller. You should refresh those. Now. Yeah, I will. So I'm just gonna refresh the page and do one of, come on. There we go. All right. OK, so the fun part of the Redux plugin is, is right here, where we actually can see what are all the actions that got dispatched to the store. And not only do I see like what does the state look like right now, so at the moment, the spa has you know, an in-flight of false. Let's actually go all the way to the end. Ah, oh, that's not what I wanted to show you. No. Um, but so anyway, the point is the dev tools give you essentially a view of all the actions as they happen over time, a view of the state at the time that that action was dispatched, and then the difference that it made, basically what happened as a result of that action, how was the store changed. And the real fancy bit is the time travel piece. So again, those of us from a uh, kind of event sourcing background really like this is that I can go back in time and see what happened to my component, right? So I'll, I'll do that in a sec. So, so we started and we got this spa schedule request that we talked about and the component did mount part of our app. So we got a spa schedule request right there and it just had a type. It said, hey, you know, go request a schedule. Then some other stuff happened where people are talking on the chat and finally I got There it is. So we're going to see things happening, things happening, things happening, success. Right? And then the loader went away and I and I retrieved my schedule. And I can click into that 
action and see, oh, here's what that action dispatched. There's the information about the spa schedule. And here's how it changed the state, right? In-flight went from true to false. I'm not in-flight anymore. And it gave me back what my schedule was so I could render it on the page. So you can imagine when you get into you know, more complex apps that have lots of things happening across different pieces of the page, being able to you know, get in the DeLorean and time travel, so to speak, can be super handy. Um, because it allows you to say, oh, I didn't mean to dispatch that action, or I didn't mean for that action to change the state in this way. Let me make my change and then see how that, that acts in the browser. Um, one cool thing that I noticed while we were developing this app is that, um, uh, yeah, um, actually a lot of companies now are actually keeping the, these developer tools uh, open. So we were on Bitbucket, and I realized that the plugin had uh, stayed open. Oh, I actually need to dive into it. Um, no, that was it. No, that was ours. No, it wasn't. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But well, you can see that. Yeah, there we go. Bit, Bitbucket, these are all the actions that are being dispatched from like this screen in Bitbucket. So a lot of uh, like pretty major companies out there are using these tools. All right. Um, so we actually already went into a little bit of this, but um, you, we need to talk to a server. So how do you do that? Um, by default, um, uh, it, with Redux, uh, the action creators, which we kind of glossed over, they are supposed to just dispatch an action, which is just a regular um, object. So there's a number of libraries that help you um, accomplish a bit more than that. For instance, um, communicate with a server via promises. If you want to do that, the most basic library out there would be uh, Redux Thunk. Uh, sagas um, kind of take a more hands-on approach and help you do more complicated things. Uh, but what we decided to do uh, was work with Redux Observable. Um, so we're going to dive into RxJS briefly. Um, oh, Redux first. But Redux Observable has an idea called epics. So you'll see a few files in our source code called um, ep, uh, like chat epic and uh, spa epic. Um, basically, they are streams that are listening for an action and then, or yeah, observables that are listening for an action and then they will dispatch actions as, uh, out, either a single action or many actions. And in some case, um, empty, which is nothing at all. Um, but we'll show you those in more detail. So uh, I'm actually going to gloss over this slide. The point here is that, you know, think of observables as streams. We've already kind of covered it, but they can be hard for people that, you know, haven't really been exposed to streams in the past. Um, my advice here, and this is definitely not a case of me practicing what I preach, is do a lot of reading before you do and kind of understand the diagrams and what an observable is before you just jump in and start coding. Because there's, if you're unfamiliar with it, it can be a pretty um, esoteric concept, I guess. But once you get it working, there's kind of an aha moment and you realize how powerful it really is. OK, so we're, gonna, we're heavily time constrained here, so I'm going to do this relatively quickly. But if we look in our app at our other component here, and I'm going to use the Redux dev tools again, if I go and register, ignore that. That's not James's wife's email address. <laughs> um, if I hit the register button here, we see another thing where I make a register request. But then I had three actions come out of it. There was a success action. And then I actually made a, a request to go get the schedule again, because I know it's been updated again. And I, I know it's been updated. And then I actually dispatched a location change. So this is another library that actually allows us to use Redux to navigate. It's called Connected React Router, or I forget the name. They changed it recently. Um, the point is that three actions came out from one action going in. Um, so how did we do that? Um, I'd love to show you the code, but we're heavily time constrained. So I'm just going to move to the next slide and show you the diagram, because it's a lot more readable. Um, so, so what? And you'll see I have the file name here if anyone wants to check it out in the project when we're done. What Redux Observable does is it takes all those Redux actions and it turns them into a stream. 
So imagine all these A's right here as action. Action one, action two, action three, action four. I call a method of type, which is just a handy dandy uh, filter, essentially, that Redux Observable provides. It says, filter this stream for only the registration request action. Then I call a merge map, and, and, and I make some AJAX request. And this is a lot of the confusion with RxJS AJAX, is that what it gives you is an observable that at some point emits one item once that HTTP request comes back and then terminates. So it's an observable with one thing in it. It's really not well suited to AJAX. In fact, a promise was always totally fine for that. But we'll see in the next slide that there's other things that observables can do that, that make it powerful. So when I call merge map, I'm just saying, when I get this action, dispatch this AJAX request. And then again, when I merge it again, I'm just saying, when the JSON comes back, emit these three other actions. Right, so that's one action in leads to three actions out that helps me do kind of more complex things with my Redux actions. And it really shines when we have something like a chat. Just, just like uh, hit a couple, type into the chat a couple times. So this chat is an open web socket, right? We don't know when we're going to get things coming through the pipe. They're just going to show up as people type in. You know, if, so, if we had another browser tab open here, you could type messages in and they would show up on you know, one side or the other and they'd just show up. So a WebSocket is not just an observable that opens up, gives you a value, and then terminates, right? You just sit there listening on it until your app dies or until you go to another page that's not worried about it. Again, we filter for like a connection request, like, hey, I want to connect to the WebSocket. And then when we merge with this socket observable, we're just sitting there listening on that stream. And what Redux Observable allows us to do is says, every time I get a frame through the socket, emit a message action, right? And when I respond to that message action, that adds a message into my store, and then it shows up in that chat component you guys saw down below. So chaining more complicated things, and in fact, I had the, um, the I wanted to do our uh, Rich's example of kind of the fork join process, but I couldn't figure out how to get my handy dandy diagram tool to draw that. <laughs> um, but things like that, again, get really powerful and kind of get hard to do um, with, with other libraries. So Redux Observable kind of is worth the, um, the initial investment in the end, I would say. So now that we went over state management and a whole bunch of other things involved with state management, we're going to kind of take a step out and be kind of continue on with other companion libraries in React. So let's talk about routing briefly. Um, React Router is probably the biggest player in the game. Um, we are using React Router on our project, but there's a whole bunch of other, um, uh, other libraries out there. Um, so actually, the React's website has a pretty comprehensive list of like 20 or more uh, libraries that you could use. Um, so uh, take a look at React Router first, but then know that there are other options out there. This is also nice if uh, you're looking at adding React onto it. Your existing, um, your existing system, your existing UI, yeah, the, the router that you are currently using might be, um, you might be able to use React with it pretty easily. Forms, uh, forms are similar. There's a lot of options out there. Um, Redux, if you're using Redux, uh, take a look at Redux forms first. It basically puts the state of each one of your like inputs um, on the global Redux state. Um, there's Formic and Formsy if you're not using Redux and using other um, state management tools. Um, but React in general has two ways of handling um, form elements. So um, React calls it the controlled and uncontrolled forms. Uh, in our app, we are using uh, controlled form. So what that means, I'll just show you a brief example in our code. So we have this chat input input box, just right here. Um, and basically we're saying that on the change of this input box, um, we're, we're basically just updating the component state. And so when uh, the component state is the same as the input box, they call it the controlled, uh, a controlled form. Um, 
uh, Redux forms basically does the same thing, but it's in your Redux state. So right now, if we went to those Redux tools, we couldn't tell you what is in this input box. Um, so it kind of keeps it the idea of like one central state for your whole app. Um, we didn't need to do something like this with such a small uh, application. Forms. <laughs> Styling, um, so there are a lot of ways to do styling <laughs> uh, with React. So I'm gonna kind of group it into four general ways, um, but there's hundreds of libraries out there to accomplish these things. So in the most, most basic scenario, you could always do global styles, which kind of most of the web had done uh, for a long period of time. But if you, if, you're all, if you have an existing app that's using global styles and you add React in, you can stick with that. That's fine. So um, one way of moving towards a more kind of component-based UI would be importing style sheets based uh, in your React components. Um, so that's a pretty simple change, but it, is, it does mean that you need to do something with your Webpack configuration. Fortunately, uh, create React app, you know, that does, it does handles that in much better ways. Um, so that's a step in the right direction. A different approach completely would be React specific styles. Here I have the logo for uh, styled components, which is a very popular library. There's a number of these out there. Um, they're React specific style solutions. So I think there's one called Glamorous. It might be called Emotion now, but it's made by PayPal. Um, there's like re RSS or um, React styles. There's the list goes on and on. But uh, the main thing here is that it, it's probably only good for you if you're starting a React app from scratch because it, you kind of need to learn your own DSL and then you can't easily kind of transfer files uh, from traditional style sheets into it um, as easily. Uh, I would say the best of all these worlds are um, CSS modules. Uh, CSS modules are basically where the industry is headed in general. Angular and Vue both support it now. Um, but basically what it does is that in your style sheet, um, when you use one of those styles, it will automatically namespace um, those styles for you. So if we take a look at our React app, and we just take a look um, anywhere, actually. Um, you can see that our styles, our class names, are actually, these are automatically generated for us. So it's the home component is the first thing. So the home component, it's a style of the home component called row. And then it's automatically adding some like small hash at the end. So you're guaranteed no naming collisions. Um, this is not the case um, with global CSS. In fact, it's the biggest problem with global CSS. And then also, um, it's, uh, this is a problem with imported um, style sheets in, um, if you're not using uh, CSS modules. There's ways around it. Um, some of you might have heard of like BM or block mod, uh, block, what is it? Yeah, element. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, there's ways of namespacing it yourself so you don't get these, um, these types of collisions. Um, but moving, I, I definitely recommend doing CSS modules if possible. However, uh, it does take a bit to set up. Um, if you're rolling your own and you doing your own Webpack configuration, it can be um, quite cumbersome. Another thumbs up for Create React app, though, as of when? They Last now month, supported. yeah. yeah okay. So they now support CSS modules by default, I think. What is it you have to say, dot module, dot sass? In your, in your CSS files and create React app, the underlying web config will figure out how to compile that and namespace it for you. So I don't know if you guys can see this because I can't make it bigger. Um, but yeah, our, so our uh, SAS uh, file is called chat input dot module dot CSS and then, um, or it's dot SAS. And um, the Webpack configuration knows when it sees um, something ending in module dot SAS or module dot CSS um, to use a different loader. Um, so uh, that's how Create React App um, handles this scenario. Back to the slides. There you go. 
Okay, so uh, we're bad developers. We're sorry we left testing for the end. Um, <laughs> Uh, just so we're kind of out of time, but um, one blurb. Actually, I don't know if any anyone has heard of Liberty JS, which is another conference which I was at a while back. And there was a talk where a guy said that um, testing is like vegetables for your code, uh, and I really liked that. And I've hung on to it. And you know, the moral of the story is you should be writing tests. Um, they're like vegetables for your code. They might not taste very good, um, but they're good for you. Um, so we mentioned earlier that. Uh, React kind of comes with Jest as a test runner, or sorry, Create React app comes with Jest as a test runner out of the box. Um, but you're free to use Mocha, Sign On, any of the other, and I think Jest is actually just Jasmine under the hood um, with React if you want. Again, kind of moral of the story of React is you can pick and choose the things that you want to use. But it turns out that Jest and Enzyme kind of couple really well together, and they provide you with two things. Um, Jest comes with this idea called snapshot testing. And Enzyme comes with this thing called the shallow renderer. Um, and what the Enzyme shallow renderer does is essentially only render the immediate level of the tree in your React component when you're writing a test. So it doesn't try to dive all the way down into your app and like lead to things that are going to fail because you didn't mock them out properly. You can use that shallow renderer and then create a snapshot out of it and then call a method called you know, myComponent.expect to match snapshot. What that gives you is kind of regression testing, right? So it's going to render your component with all the test props that you gave it, and then create a snapshot of what the result was. And every time you run your tests again, it's going to compare the results against that snapshot. And if something changes, it's going to fail. And what that protects against is kind of like, oh, I made this change to my component, but it was just behavior, and I didn't intend for it to actually change the way things look that's going to fail a test for you and give you that nice regression. And then you can say, yes, this is OK. Update the snapshot. I meant to do that. Or, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, let me go back and see what I did. Um, just a quick opinion on that, and then we'll wrap up, is that snapshot testing is really nice, but it is quite easily abused. Um, it provides you a lot of code coverage in your code coverage tool really quickly, and it allows you to get a test up and running really quickly. But it's quite easy to just go through all your components and say, I expect this to match the snapshot, I expect this to match the snapshot, and then every time something changes, you're wading through all these different changes, you're like, yeah, I think this looks fine, just update the snapshot, I don't care. I recommend you use snapshots just for exactly that, which is regression testing, maybe one test at the end of each test file or a couple that say, hey, these are my regressions, that this is how this thing should render. You should just use regular assertions for other stuff. Right, so if you're, if you're expecting behavior to change an input element, then you should expect that when I change this state that this Ill input element's value has changed. You shouldn't just say expect it to match the snapshot and move on because that can get dangerous when you've got lots and lots of snapshot tests in your code base. Um, and I think that's it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, oh. <laughs> we'll wrap up with um, who we think React is good for. So uh, we're going to start with um, existing projects. This is um, uh, Angular, as we stated earlier. It's not so great if you have some existing code that you want to work with. Um, whereas React is a small enough library um, that uh, you could just kind of add it in and maybe uh, kind of take over just a small portion of your DOM, make that a React component. We saw how with Create React App, we were taking over that whole page. But we could, you know, you could just make it, you know, your, some search bar functionality if we wanted to. Um, and then pre uh, to, um, React 16, you could also not even need Babel in the transpilation process. You could just do React uh, Create class to get started. Um, I don't know if that's recommended, but it's also, it's a possibility. So. Strong development teams that want flexibility in their code. They want to be able to choose which libraries they want to bring in and um, are very opinionated. So React is a great choice for that because it's just one tool and you can bring in a whole world of options. If you don't want to use RxJS and you just want to make simple HTTP requests to a simple server, just use Redux Thunk and off you go, right? So you're free to make that choice with React. Um, and then really small projects that don't have a lot of requirements for like, you know, some huge, you know, central state. Um, and it's just something small. Uh, React is a perfect fit for that. Um, you don't need to bring in very many libraries. Um, and it, it's pretty easy to get going uh, with Create React App. So, thanks.